Hi, y'all. We'll get started a few minutes after the top of the hour to let more people funnel in. Thanks everyone for waiting a little bit while people funneled in. Um, I just need to do a tech thing on my side and we will be live in one second. Thank you all for joining this session of We the World's 11 Days of Global Unity. My name is Callum. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the human rights coordinator here at We the World. A physical description of myself, I'm white with a beard. I have short above the ear brown hair. I'm wearing navy glasses, and I have on a navy button down that has light blue dots on it. Behind me is a blue wall with photos of the outdoors hung up. This event is being streamed from northern New Jersey, the seized and current lands of the Muncie Lenape. I'd like to acknowledge their ancestors who were removed by colonialism to Oklahoma, Ohio, and Canada. Today, the Muncie Lenape live both on the lands to which they were removed and their homelands that encompass eastern Pennsylvania, northern New Jersey, southern New York State, and New York City. The Lenape Nation signed the first treaty between Native Americans and settlers in 1778. 244 years later, we have the responsibility to uphold these treaties and all treaties. <laughs> 
As someone on this land, I plan to uplift the Muncie Three Sisters Farm that promotes land sovereignty and justice as a way to heal and rebuild Indigenous community. I encourage you to learn about the Indigenous land you reside on and an action you may take to uphold the treaties in your location. We all know the rhyme in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. While many of us don't know that a dangerous president was following Columbus's arrival to what the colonizers called the New World. Soon after Columbus arrived on Turtle Island, the indigenous name for North America, the Doctrine of Discovery was issued. The doctrine was simple. When European Christian nations, quote unquote, found new land, they were automatically granted property rights and sovereignty over those lands. This began the decimation of Native American sovereignty and self-reliance. To European settlers, the doctrine meant that they could, quote unquote, call finders keepers, as Native people were not allowed to sell their lands to anyone except the discovering country. The doctrine allowed for swift colonization of the land and was the basis for future detrimental laws that were ruled on 300 years later in court. Four laws in the 1800s assisted settlers in cementing their assertions from the doctrine. Fletcher v. Peck of 1810 reinforced that Native Americans have the rights of ownership but may not engage in land dealings with any other European country. In the first case of the infamous Marshall Trilogy, Johnson v. Amintosh of 1823 reinforce that tribes do not have full sovereignty over their lands and cannot legally engage in land dealings with entities outside the United States federal government. Native peoples only have the right of occupancy while the federal government owned the soil they stood on. Clifford Little in a journal article on this topic equates the relationship to being that of a landlord and tenant. Not only did the federal government own the land, but they have the right to end the occupancy of native peoples in addition to regulating and controlling how the land was used. To further expand settler access to land, resources, and riches, the federal government and President Jackson pushed the, to pass the Indian Removal Act in 1830. This act allowed the government to force all native communities residing in the east to west of the Mississippi. The settler mantra of kill the Indian, save the man, was still flourishing, as was assimilation methods. This gave rise to the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 that attempted to force settler concepts of private property on Native communities. Those who were part of a cer certain tribes or reservations were allotted up to 160 acres of land for themselves and their families. The surplus lands went towards land acquisition strategies and 60 to 90 million acres were sold to non-natives. Native communities were strongly self-reliant prior to colonization. Reservation life sparked mass disconnections from the land in addition to dependence on the federal government. Native culture, spirituality, language, and life ways are based on the land and the doctrine of discovery Indian Removal Act and allotment were the catalyst that cultivated the vulnerability, allowing for the missing and murdered indigenous relatives epidemic to thrive. Reservations are where we can see self-reliance truly wiped out. Once on the reservation, Native peoples were not allowed to leave. The Comanche and Northern Cheyenne attempted to escape. Those who were not killed by the army were for forcefully brought back to the reservation. While their ancestral lands gave them all the subsistence they needed to survive, Native peoples on res reservations did not have the space to hunt, nor did their traditional crops grow well. Without access to resources to sustain life, Native communities became reliant on the federal government. Settlers confined Native communities to strict boundaries in order to acquire their lands and ensured these boundaries were away from areas of economic growth and development in the new world. <laughs>
In order to diminish land rights and solve any further, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1874, case of U.S. v. Cook, that even on reservations, Native peoples were only occupants with no ownership rights. With no land rights and no consistent access to food, Native communities became increasingly vulnerable. To continue their control and dominance, the federal government began ruling on laws regarding jurisdiction. Native communities now had to rely on the federal government for shelter, water, food, and justice. The federal government acquisition strategies were opening the doors for them to colonize Native bodies. Jurisdiction in Indian country is a lengthy and complicated topic, but I wanted to detail three legal cases that play a part in perpetuating the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives epidemic. The Major Crimes Act of 1885 gave federal jurisdiction to prosecute certain crimes if the perpetrator and victim are both Native and the acts are committed in Indian territory. U.S. v. Ramsey of 1926 ruled that reservations were Indian country and the, thus the federal government had jurisdiction over crimes committed against Native peoples. This was followed in 1978 by Oliphant v. Suquamish Indian tribe, where it was determined that tribal courts had no criminal jurisdiction to prosecute non-Natives for crimes committed on Native land. If a tribal court attempts to prosecute a non-Native perpetrator, the court risks reversal of the conviction. So our timeline has shown how settlers used the doctrine of discovery to remove and then confine in connection to their drive for more land and more resources. Poverty on reservations has continued for the last 192 years since the Indian Removal Act. On Minnesota reservations, 77% of participants in a research study had faced long-term homelessness. Unemployment rate on reservations ranged from 40% to 80% in the adult populations. A 2018 study shows that poverty rates among Native Americans was 25.4% compared to the 10.1% rate of white counterparts. Author Sarah Deer states, the legacy of relocation, chronic poverty, and historical trauma significantly reduces the opportunities available for Native women and makes them vulnerable to prostitution and sex trafficking. Laws rooted in assimilation and decimation and the creation of reservations has played a massive role in the poverty, insecurities, and historical trauma that leave all relatives vulnerable. Federal jurisdiction was then created for Federal jurisdiction then created a tipping point for victimization of Native peoples. It has been recorded that 96% of Native women experienced violence by a non-Native perpetrator, but due to the Oliphant ruling of 1978, tribes have no jurisdiction to prosecute non-Native offenders. Communities cannot rely on the federal government who generally has jurisdiction over missing and murdered indigenous relatives re related crimes. As data from 2016 showed that 35% of cases were not sent for prosecution, and in 2017, that rose to 37%. And this does not mean that the cases that were sent for prosecution had conviction, which leaves victims to never receive justice. Extractive industries for attaining resources has been a prime outcome of settler land acquisition goals. We can see the consequences of the extractive industries on missing and murdered indigenous relatives in the back and oil region. From 2006 to 2012, violent crimes have increased by 70% in the region. Counties outside the oil region saw an 8% reduction in crime in the same time period. Homicide, rape, sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault increased in the Bakken region by 30% while declining by 4% in other counties outside the region. Unlawful sexual contact experienced by women rose by 
Native American individuals in the oil region had rates of violent victimization 2.5 times higher than their white counterparts. Proposed in 2008, the Keystone XL was planned to transport tar sand oil. The existing pipeline system in the Keystone XL project would run through Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Oklahoma, and Texas. The Sovereign Body Institute found that within North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Nebraska, there were 411 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girl cases. In a two-year period between 2017 and 2019, there were approximately 30 to 40 cases per year. Of the 411 cases, 20% were in counties of or adjacent to the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. Pardon me. With four and five of the cases going unsolved. Data from men and boys is sparse compared to women, girls, and two spirit individuals. However, the National Institute of Justice found that 80% of Native American and Alaska Native men have experienced violence, totaling 1.4 million individuals. Native men are also 1.3 times more likely to face violence than non-Hispanic white males. The Navajo Nation maintains a list of those who go missing on or off the reservation, dating back decades. As of 2020, the list contained 160 names. 60 to 70% of those were male. A report given by the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence found staggering results in their state's missing and murdered indigenous relatives population. Unlike most data shows, the missing and murdered indigenous relatives population in Idaho is mostly men. The rate of missing and murdered indigenous relatives is 18.99 per 100,000 people compared to the 10.38 per 100,000 people for the white population. Native Americans comprise 2.4% of Idaho's population, yet account for 4.4% of the missing persons. The Doctrine of Discovery manufactured a conquest of Native American lands and bodies. Over a 200-year period, settlers established laws to remove tribes from their ancestral lands, er eradicating self-reliance and forcing them onto lands over which they had no rights or sovereignty. The ability to rely on land and community dynamics for substance and economic prosperity created the recipe needed to seize Native bodies. The federal government reaffirmed this domination through law, removing all tribal ability to bring to bring justice for and healing to missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Settlers land acquisition standards are inseparably woven into the missing and murdered indigenous relative ep epidemic. The decimation of tribal sovereignty was the decimation of body sovereignty. And that is it for the education part. I believe my colleague who was going to be here tonight um, to give the indigenous perspective is not able to make it. She is actually up in Ontario at um, a Native Women's Association meeting. Um, but I will talk about her a little bit. Um, so my colleague, Shannon Crossbear, uh, lives up in Minnesota and is Ojibwe. Um, like I said, she was going to join us tonight to talk about um, the Indigenous perspective. But here at We the World, she is our interdependence coordinator. And as you can see from this program tonight, interdependence is a very big topic when talking about colonialism and the effects on Native communities. And with that, if there are any questions, um, you can put them in the q and I already see one. So let's see. Clean Water Minnesota office says, how does a non 
prosecution array compared to non-native populations. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, off of the top of my head, I do not have the statistics, um, but I can tell you just from basic trends, um, there tends to be a trend, um, as we even saw tonight, of at least non-Hispanic white communities having um, either higher rates of prosecution or at least cases going to prosecution. So tonight, those percentages were cases that just weren't prosecuted or sent to be for prosecution. Um, and like I said, even though it sounds like about 60 something percent were sent for prosecution, that doesn't mean there was an outcome. Um, it doesn't mean anyone was convicted. So there is, um, even with other underrepresented communities, um, especially the black community, um, if people don't know, the black community uh, has a lot of injustices when it comes to the justice system, just like indigenous communities. So those prosecution rates are definitely lower for them. And um, from the data I've noticed just from my research, um, Native communities um, tend to be pretty high. So do Black communities. And then usually it's Latinx communities. Um, and white and Asian communities can kind of um, be equal for, um, I don't want to say the best data, but um, getting the most, in this case, would be like with the most prosecution rates. Um, and an important thing here is to not just um, think about prosecution rates um, overall, but think about them in relation to how much there are of that population. So that can make a big impact. Let me try to find this slide. So um, I don't think it is up on the screen, but like I mentioned with the, the Idaho study, only 2.45% of Idaho's population is Native American, but yet 4.4% of missing persons is are Native American. So there are um, drastic differences when you start looking at the total population. Because um, when you take even that 18.99 um, per, per 100,000, um, that's the rate for missing and murdered Indigenous relatives of um, Indigenous descent. And for white populations, it's 10.38 per 100,000. There are a lot more white um, people than there are Native American people. So 18.99 is even more impactful when you think about that uh, population difference there too. If there are any more questions, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A. I can also open the chat if you do not know how to use the Q&A, which is perfectly fine. Stop sharing my screen. And if there are no more questions, uh, this will be available for uh, recording. Uh, we generally put it up on our YouTube page, The We Campaign, um, usually within a week of our 11 days event ending, which it ends on the 21st. But you can also find it at facebook.com slash The We Campaign as it automatic records when we go live, if you want to share it there. And we have a couple more days of 11 days. Um, so you can go to 11 days, uh, a numerical, 
of globalunity.org to find the rest of our schedule. Greatly appreciate y'all joining tonight um, and have a good rest of your night.